Beep. Okay. So Faraday once uh, dis was thinking about, as I was discussed yesterday, um, if current can cause a magnetic field, can a magnetic field cause current? Uh, or in this case, the current causes the motor to turn as was shown a day ago or two days ago. What happens if we turn the motor ourselves? Will it create a current? Will it be backwards? And that's what a generator is. A generator is just an electric motor that's being forced to turn and it creates a current. How does it create a current? Well, yesterday we found that if you force a wire through a magnetic field, it creates an EMF. Now, we're going to explain that a little bit more as we go on here, but uh, basically, if you turn this thing around in this magnetic field, you will see the voltages or the current basically going back and forth. Um, and how fast you turn that around, you'll get a current going back and forth. Now, we can just kind of envision it that uh, this is the side, the cross section of this. When we see uh, a wire going this way and the other wire is going that way, they're not, it's going not perpendicular to the magnetic field. It's going parallel with the magnetic field. So the induced EMF at that point is zero. But when they're at this point, that one's going that way, that one's going that way, and the magnetic field is perpendicular, you'll get an induced EMF. And then if you follow that procedure and you re repeat it here and here, you'll see that the current actually goes backwards and forwards. And it'll generate it back and forth. Okay, and it's all because of that formula. Uh, if we could get that generator spinning 60 times a second, then the current coming off of that is AC current going back and forth 60 times a second and we get the power, the current, the energy coming into, the, into our circuits at 60 hertz, which th it actually is. And this is basic design of a generator, but let's just understand that a little bit further in physics. So let's turn over to page two. So how can we use this knowledge of induced voltage in a wire in a more desired state, one where we can induce a voltage in a loop, hence a circuit. Consider the following example. I'm going to move this loop from A to B, or from at A, and then I'm going to be moving it at B, and then moving it at C, moving it at D, moving it at E, moving it at F. At which one, or at which many of these points, will uh, there be an induced current? Okay? A. There's no magnetic field, so it's not going to induce a current at A, okay? At B, it's going through a magnetic field in this area, and there's, there's going to be a current here because this wire here from that point to that point is moving perpendicularly to the magnetic field, so there's going to be a current, and if we look at C, the wire here is going to be moving, but so is this wire. And those are going to be opposing. So C is not going to produce a current, but B will produce a current. D won't produce a current because both edges, again, are in the magnetic field. So D won't produce a current, but E will because this wire is still in a magnetic field and still traveling through it and being forced through it, so that will produce it, but the wire on the outside of the magnetic field will not. So there's no op opposition, so that will produce it, but the F again is outside, so we won't do it. Now, let's explain it. Let's, is there a pattern here? For sure there's a pattern. Uh, when one side of the loop is inside the magnetic field. 
Okay? That's the pattern. Only when one side of the loop is in the magnetic field it seems to work. To explain this, Faraday actually went beyond this in a deeper thought. And he said, realized that the voltage and therefore the current in a coil of wire was induced when the area of the coil that was exposed to the magnetic field changed. Or the amount of magnetic field in the wire, in the loop, changed. So if you take a look at that, as I move it at this point, the magnetic field inside is not changing. But here, the magnetic field inside this loop is changing. There's a change. There's no change there. There's no change here. There's no change here because it's always in a constant. But there's a change in magnetic field inside this loop. And there's no change here. And that's what he said. And he saw that. And it was ingenious. Okay, so he came up with this new term called magnetic flux. And magnetic flux is the number of magnetic fields passing through the coil. Okay, how much basically of the magnetic field was passing through it? And we have a new Greek letter, and you probably haven't seen this one before. And it's called Psi, P-S-I, Psi. And that is the Greek letter for magnetic flux and the letter that we used. The units for it is Weber's, and abbreviated is capital W, small b. A unique one like Hertz is capital H, small z. Okay, and how do we calculate it? Okay, it's calculated by the magnetic field times the area the area of the loop. And we basically want them perpendicular. So if we have a magnetic field traveling downwards and we have a loop, we want the magnetic field going perpendicular to the plane of the loop. Okay? So sometimes you'll even see this as B perpendicular A. Because if they're parallel, then none of it's going through. Okay, so here's example number one. We have a loop, lots of loops like that, and it's in two dimensions, and we're going to have a... and it's going to spin. So we have some of it the other side of the loop's on the back side, so I'm not going to draw it much here. It's just dotted lines behind it. So we have magnetic field lines going through the loop, and the loop is now turning. And now it's going to turn entirely until it's on its edge. So the mag number of magnetic field lines here compared to here that are passing through the loop has decreased. So here psi is maxed out. And here, psi, the magnetic flux, is zero. There's no magnetic field lines going through it. So we didn't really change the area of the loop, we changed the orientation of the loop. But that realistically changed the amount of area that the magnetic field was going through. So swing on over to the next page, please. Let's go through. We have nine different scenarios. Describe whether the flux is increasing or decreasing or constant in each case below. So we have a, a loop. You can't see the back of it. It's going behind, right? And the magnetic field is increasing. 
Okay, it's increasing. And we want to find out whether the magnetic flux, which is B times A, is what's happening to B. I mean, what's happening to flux? And here, the flux is going up. Okay? Why? Well, B is increasing. It's B times A. Now we have, in part B, we have the magnetic field lines are decreasing. So beforehand, there was lots of field lines here. And now we're decreasing them. So B is decreasing. So here, flux is going down. Another scenario. A loop is moving till it's halfway out of a magnetic field. What's happening to the flux? Colin? Increasing or decreasing? Or staying the same? I didn't hear. Increasing? Why do you think it's increasing? Okay, it's a guess. How many people would guess with them saying that it's increasing? How many say it's staying the same? How many say it's going down? Okay, vote democracy says going down. It's going from full magnetic field lines inside to half of it, so it's decreasing. Let's look at B, I mean D here. And let's talk with uh, either of the Bryans. As this rail, as this bar is moving along the rails to the right, we have the loop here, and that's our area. Because that's the loop. As that rail moves, how is flux changing? As that beam is moving, how is the flux changing on the rails? Is it staying on the rails? Yes. The area is getting bigger. As the as the V as this bar moves, as the bar moves over to here, we now have we have a larger amount of area. So the 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 area is increasing. Okay. How about E here? You're moving it and it's staying inside the same magnetic field constant. It's not changing. Okay, here we go. We're going to move a magnet to this coil. What's going to happen? It, the flux is going to increase. Good, because it's getting stronger and stronger magnetic field. Okay? How about we spin the coil in G here? If we spin the coil, the amount of area that is available for the magnetic field to go through is decreasing because we have to do it perpendicular. Physically, A is not changing. Physically, B is not changing. But the amount that can be going through by because they are perpendicular. You were losing the perpendicular of it until, in the previous example, until it went flush with the magnetic field, became zero. So it was maximum here and decreased to nothing. So just spinning it decreases <laughs> at this point it'll decrease it. And then once it goes away from perpendicular and starts becoming horizontal again how about we physically shrink the loop? Maybe this is a spring or a slinky that we made into a big loop and as the slinky contracts, what's going to happen? The area is decreasing, so the flux is decreasing. Okay? Now we have two separate circuits here. Well, two separate loops. One, we're controlling the current is increasing here. So what's going to happen to the flux through that loop? It's going to increase. Why is the flux increasing there? Because as the current increases, the magnetic field lines that are going around it are increasing, 
And if they're increasing, then the magnetic field lines going through the loop is increasing. Okay. So previously, we had said that the induced voltage was created when we changed the field orientation or the field in the air or the area in the field. We can now say more simply that an induced voltage is created by the flux changes. Faraday found that the voltage varies directly as the flux change, inversely as the time, and directly as the number of loops. So the formula is, and I'm just going to give it to you. Okay, why does it depend on how many loops there are, where n is the number of, of coils? Because each coil, each wrap of wire is another area. And that's just going to be a number. Won't have units. The flux is the B perpendicular to A, and that's in Weber's. And time is T, and that's going to be in seconds. Okay. The only thing I haven't explained here, really, that you would go, I don't know, is why is it a negative? And we're going to discuss that in about uh, a half a lesson away. Okay, so let's just try that right now. Circle loop of wire, 2.5 centimeters in radius, in a magnetic field of 0.4 teslas. If it's removed from the field in 0 0.05 seconds, so like a 20th of a second, what is the average induced EMF? Okay, so we have this formula, negative n delta phi, phi or psi? I'm now mixed up, psi. So how many loops are there? There's one. The time was given as 0 0.050 seconds. <laughs> Okay, the change in phi means psi final minus psi initial. Psi final is zero because there's no magnetic field. And this one is B initial magnetic field times the area. And they are perpendicular already. It does say that in the, in the brackets there of the question. So the change in psi is going to be negative 0 0.4 teslas times the area. What's the area of this loop? Pi r squared, which is pi times the r, which is uh, 0 0.025 meters. And we have to square that. And we still have to have this 0 0.04 teslas in front. And it's still going to be negative. If you have um, 0 minus, minus, is it positive? No, it isn't minus. Yeah, but it's not minus minus. It will be. Will r, r because magnetic field cannot be a negative, and area can't be a negative. So this term will never be negative. OK? So the change in psi here will be negative, because we're subtracting it. And let's pull up the calculator. And it's uh, 0.4 times pi times 0 0.025 squared. So we get 7.85 times 10 to the negative fourth Weber's.
a negative four. Sorry, whoops. So let's plug that into our equation. Epsilon is negative one. That's the number of wraps. And the psi is 7.85 times 10 to the negative four Weber's. And the time is 0 0.05 seconds. Throwing that into our calculator. Divide that by, and this is also a negative number. Divide the answer by 0 0.05, and we get 0 0.0157 volts. Okay. Um, the psi will be negative, and this has a negative. It will be positive, but right now, just don't worry about the sign. Okay, because the next part of the lesson talks about that sign more specifically. Okay, so get a head start on number four. Try it on out. Okay. Remember, it is a square with five centimeters on each side. So the area is going to be 0 0.05 squared. The number of turns is 100. That's how many time wraps there are. It's going in two thousandths of a second. So to calculate the change in phi, or the change in the flux, zero minus, because it ends off, rotated at 90 degrees, so there's no more flux. It starts off perpendicular, so it's zero minus the initial flux. Oh, sorry, that's uh, all that stuff. <laughs> there we go. So it's zero minus the initial magnetic field times the area. So it's not much, it's a small little loop. So there's only negative five times 10 to the negative five Weber's is the change. It goes from full, mag full flux to no flux, so it's a negative. It's, a, it's a decreasing the amount of Weber's. Yep. So this is going to be negative, and there's 100 turns. The change in the flux is negative 5 times 10 to the negative 5 Weber's. And the time is a two thousandth of a second. So this is going to be 2.5 volts. Okay, we can also change the flux by changing the magnetic field. Since magnetic field is a vector, however, we have to call one direction positive and one direction negative. So let's uh, look at number five. A circular coil with 100 turns of wire is exposed to a changing magnetic field, as shown. So it starts off with the magnetic field going into the page and ends off with it coming out of the page. And that change takes 0 0.12 seconds. What is the average induced voltage? Okay, so I'll, get, I'll let you get a head start on this again and I'll come back. Let's show you how far I've gotten so far. Okay. One of the things that I did mentally here, and I might as well write it down so that you see it, I'm going to say 
that coming going into the page was positive and coming out of the page was negative. You have to set which one is negative and which one's positive. Oop, can't see it again, eh? My goodness. So I, in red there, this one's positive. I said that's positive and that's negative. You have to just have to determine which, which direction is negative and positive, so when you subtract them, you get something, because they're in opposite directions. So the final is out of the page, and it's 5.4 Teslas, and the initial was into the page at 7.8. And then we have to go pi r squared. So when you calculate this with your calculator, let's try it out. So negative 5.4 subtract 7.8. That is the change in the magnetic field. And then we have to multiply that by the area, which is pi. And we have to multiply that by r squared. And the radius is 10 centimeters. So it's 0.1 squared. So we get the change in the flux to be negative 0 0.41. Five or four seven, if you want. Weber's. So, what is the induced voltage? Epsilon is equal to negative n. Change in phi. All over the change in time. So that equals one hundred loops again. And there's a negative outside it. The change in the flux is negative 0.4. So I'll put a 0 here. 0 0.4147 Weber's all over the change in time, which is 0 0.12. So multiply this by 100 and divide it by 0.12. And we get, and it'll be positive, because I didn't put the negative in there, so it'll be positive, 345.6 volts. Okay, let's do number six. Let's just rank them. Which one will have the maximum induced voltage and which one will have the least. Okay? Well, A is moving entirely out of the circuit where B is staying entirely sorry, inside the magnetic field and inside the magnetic field and outside. So I would say for sure that A will be max max voltage and B would be uh, zero voltage. Which one do you think? D is squeezed a bit, and C looks like it's pulled out halfway. I think D would be bigger than C. No, probably not. The other way around. But it depends on squeezing a bit. Is that half or not? I think D is not even half. So C would be half of it changed. So there's our ranking. A, C, D, B. Technical comment on induced voltage. The, for wires, when you're moving wires, okay folks, how do you know which formula to use in physics 12? This is a good one. How do you know which formula to use? We use that for moving wires. And when it's coils, then we use the new one that I just showed you today. Let's talk about Lenz's law. This is part B of the lesson. So, 
uh, we're going to move this magnet to the coils. Will there be an induced current in the coil? You bet there will be. Why? Because there's a magnetic field. Which direction would it be? Hmm. How do we determine that? Right hand rule. Okay, well, let's just take a sneak peek down here. Lenz's law. <clears throat> An induced current will always create a magnetic field that opposes the change in flux that created the induced current in the first place. So the current that's going to be created will actually create a magnetic field, right? Because once we have a current going, it's going to create a magnetic field. And it's going to oppose it. So hold on, okay, take a look. How would I, if I had to put a, a north and a south on this solenoid, what would oppose the motion of that? If I put a north here and a south here, right? It's definitely not attracted to it, it's going to be repelled. So that would oppose it. How do I get a north and a south appearing there? Well, I, then I want the magnetic field lines coming out of here and going to here. That's what a north and a south does. Nice try. Okay. So I want the magnetic field lines coming out like that. So I want the magnetic field coming out of the solenoid. How do I do that? Use the right hand rule. You point your thumb, your fingers in the direction on the inside that way. That makes your thumb point up. Try your right hand rule, pull out your hand, and grab onto that rope so that the fingers go to the left on the inside. That means if you did it with your right hand rule, right, your thumb, uh, how do I draw your hand? There you go, your thumb and your fingers wrap on the inside. I can't do that. Shh, there's, shh, I'm drawing a hand, careful. And I don't want to get fired here, so there's my hand. And the fingers are wrapping around on the inside. There's my solid thumb. My knuckles. And the fingers are on the inside. Oh, goodness gracious. Got to delete that. I don't like that. Try it. Okay? Lenz's law. Lenz's law says <coughs> the direction, the direction of Faraday's law will be always in the direction to oppose what's happening. Okay? This explains why there's a negative in Faraday's law here. It's going to oppose it. So, here it is. Number seven. Observe up here. We have a magnetic field. The region is into the page. So here is the magnetic field. Everyone, not much more time. And afterwards, it's coming out. We just finished calculating these in the previous questions, boys. We calculated what the EMF was, right? Sometimes you came negative and positive. We're not going to worry about that. We're going to use Lenz's law here to determine which way the current's going to flow. Will it go clockwise or will it go counterclockwise? So, how do we do that? A loop is placed in the region here and the field then changes so that it's pointing out of the page. What is the direction? So, what's happening is we're getting a lot of magnetic field lines coming out. Right? We want to oppose that. So put a lot of magnetic field lines going in to this loop. So we don't want them. We want to oppose them. So you, gr you put your fingers into the loop, so into the page here, and which way does your thumb point? That way. Try it at the top. 
Hold your hand so that the finger, to hang on to the top of it with your fingers on the inside of the loop, and you'll see that the current's going that way. So that is the direction of the current. Yeah, your fingers loop on the inside of it, and the current's going to go around. Okay, so that is the direction of the current. We don't need a positive EMF and a negative EMF. Okay? And then grab the bottom, put your fingers in it, into the loop, and it would have to be going to the left, right? Okay, number eight. The diagram, oh, this is a provincial examinable question. Take a look here. The diagram below shows an aluminum ring and a current induced by it by moving it. Okay? Now, which way is it moving? We see the current in the ring. And there's a magnet moving. Well, is it moving? It could be stationary. We just learned that it had to be moving to create a current. Okay? So the current's going down in this ring. If it's going down in that ring, then it's creating a magnetic field. Use your fingers pointing down, it's creating a magnetic field going this way. Coming out that way. So that means this is a north and that's a south. Right? Yep, try out your right hand. Right? If there's current in that ring, then the fingers are pointing towards the magnet. Now, this is what it's creating. That current is creating it to oppose the motion of that magnet. To oppose it. What is it going to do to that magnet? It's going to attract it. Right? And if that's the opposite, what is that magnet doing? It must be obviously moving away. If it's moving away and you want to oppose it, you're going to try to pull it back. And if it's moving to the right, if it's moving to the right, the current in that loop would uh, make a field to oppose that motion, which is to pull it back. And to pull it back, then it would have to be a north end on the right side of that loop, which I just drew there. So we've just worked back and forwards. So that means that it's moving to the right. Okay. It's one of those logic ones. So, let's go on to number nine. Will the induced current in the circuit below flow through 15 ohms? Uh, will, uh, will that below flow through the 15 ohm circuit, will it go from X to Y or from Y to X? So beforehand, the magnetic field's going into the page, and afterwards, it's coming out of the page. Which way will it flow? Okay? So Jackson, if it's becoming into the page here, I mean out of the page, to oppose it, we want to put it into the page. We want to, this is the, op, what I'm drawing in here in red is to oppose the increase. So which way will that circuit have to flow up top here? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Use your right hand and figure out which way it'll create the magnetic field going into the page. Ryan or Jack, Jackson? Either of you got which direction that is going to be? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Put your fingers inside that circle, pointing down, your fingers, not your thumb. Which way is the current going to flow in that loop? 
It's going to flow up there and down here. Because your fingers have to point inside that loop, it's the right hand. That means the current's going to flow that way. So this is again, provincial level question, right? It's going to flow from Y to X. If we're moving a, uh, if we're moving the magnet to the left, find the coils induced north pole and the direction of the current. Kind of, but now it's moving away. So if it's moving away, we need to attract it back. So this needs to be a south, and that needs to be a north. And to make that a south, the magnetic field lines go this way, and inside they go, and they come out that way. So to make the current flow in a p that direction, point your fingers on the inside there, and the current's going to have to flow that direction. Okay, if I have a loop of wire sitting beside another loop of wire, and I start increasing the current in this loop one, so we'll call this loop one. If I increase the current in loop one, what's going to happen in loop two? Well, let's see, let's follow this logic. If I increase the the current in loop one, I create a magnetic field. And loop two here will experience an increasing magnetic field. So it's going to create a current to oppose it. Okay. The, if this is increasing, if I is increasing in this direction, then what's happening is the magnetic field over here is increasing uh, going into the page, sorry, going into the page because this loop is here, so the loop over here is increasing going into it. We want to oppose it, so we want current coming out of it. So current's going to flow this way, in this one. But what I'm trying to get at here is we could figure out the direction, but look, if I change the current in one of the wires, the wire beside it also has a changing current. These two wires are not attached, but as one current changes, the other one is forced to change. And these circuits are not touching each other. They're right beside each other. This is the basics of a transformer. We're going to be talking about transformers next day. And, but this is an induced circuit. We can, by changing the current in one device, we get a current changing in another device. But the whole idea here is we need changing currents. If there's no changing currents, then the magnetic field is not changing. And if the magnetic field's not changing, then it doesn't induce it. So, does anyone have an electric toothbrush at home? Okay. Have you ever looked at the outside of that electric toothbrush? If it sits in a charger, how does it charge the electric toothbrush? If you look at the electric toothbrush that sits in a charger, there is no metal on the outside of that toothbrush so that you can sit in the shower and brush your teeth and not get electrocuted or charged from it or releasing the charge. So we have a toothbrush that sits in its cradle and gets charged but doesn't get attached via the circuit. Or how about those iPhone new uh, cases? that all you have to do is sit your iPhone on this table and it charges. It, it can sit anywhere in that table and it charges. So you take your devices 
out of your pocket, your cell phone, your iPhone, your iPod, and you just sit it down on the table and it charges. How does it do that? There's no current, no wires attached to it. Like how do I charge my Android device? I have to physically plug it in through the, um, the uh, USB slot here and charge it up that way. I have to physically plug it in. Or I get a new case on this that plugs into that, but no metal on the outside, and part of the case has induction coils in it, a wire. That all to do is change the magnetic field very fast in that wire, through that wire, and current's going to flow in that wire. And if current flows in that wire, then I charge my battery. So without actually connecting it up, touching metal to metal to cause a circuit, I can have a device that's totally enclosed in insulator and I could still charge up the stuff inside it. And that's what happens. That's, what ha that's how we charge our toothbrushes. That's how we charge our other devices like uh, a cell phone and stuff like that by just sitting it on a table through induction. Okay? Any questions?